1932 Times Literary Supplement, 8th Kidding the Truth. Not to the purpose is appropriate, but it is both too broad in scope and too vague. It covers digressions and innocent irrelevancies, which are not invariably instances of bull. Furthermore, saying that bull is not to the purpose leaves it uncertain what purpose is meant. The reference in both definitions to hot air is more helpful. When we characterize talk as hot air, we mean that what comes out of the speaker's mouth is only that. It is mere vapor. His speech is empty without substance or content. His use of language, accordingly, does not contribute to the purpose it purports to share. No more information is communicated than if the speaker had merely exhaled. There are similarities between hot air and excrement, incidentally, which make hot air seem an especially suitable equivalent for bullshit. Just as hot air is speech that has been emptied of all informative content, so excrement is matter from which everything nutritive have been removed. Excrement may be regarded as the corpse of nourishment, what remains after the vital elements in food have been exhausted. In this respect, excrement is a representation of death that we ourselves produce, and that indeed we cannot help producing in the very process of maintaining our lives. Perhaps it is for making death so intimate that we find excrement so repulsive. In any event, it cannot serve the purposes of sustenance any more than hot air can serve those of communication. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you uh, come in there. Hello. Welcome to Bitcoin Talk Show. Today is Sunday, June 17th, 2018. My name is Thomas Hunt. And first, let's just take a bit a look at what's going on in Bitcoin news today. The price of Bitcoin was down 0.19% in the last 24 hours, with a last of 6,485, a high of 6,576, and a low of 6,356. That's $1 for 15,444 Satoshis. Our top story, Bitcoin price to reach $60,000 in 2018, question mark. Cryptocurrency ex expert, <laughs> so I almost said excrement, remains resolute on January prediction. Cryptocurrency and initial coin offering expert, ooh, you just downgraded his quality, Philip Nunn made a prediction in January that Bitcoin would reach lows of 6,000 and highs of 60,000. Nunn recently reiterated his confidence in the prediction after the price of Bitcoin plummeted almost 18% last week. He says it's going to disrupt everything. And he's already predicted the drop to 6,000, which we already had. He says the reality is that we're moving from an internet of information to an internet of value. It's going to disrupt everything. Money, record keeping, legal. Sounds like what we've been saying for five years now. I'm glad he finally woke up. He says that his prediction was based on market volatility which we're experiencing at the moment. He thinks that's really apparent, and he absolutely stands by his prediction. $60,000 a coin by the end of 2018. We'd have to see some serious price action to get there. Hang on to your hats. Bitcoin price analysis. BTC slash USD flirts with long-term support. Make or break from here. And as we've been saying, Bitcoin is just around the long-term support area. That's a line that you get if you draw through all of the lows that we've ever had. And until previously, it always went up. There is some concern that we are breaking the long-term support, as you can see right here on his chart. Low, 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 low. That's an REM song. That's a great reference. Uh, but we have slightly dipped below the line. I don't know if that means we'll keep dipping or if we'll recover above the line, uh, but they are keeping an eye on these lines for us. President of Zappo, Bitcoin will become the global reserve asset. And this is one of the most bullish use cases for Bitcoin. Right now, the central banks don't really have a global asset. They use the United States dollar in lieu of a truly global asset. But could you imagine if all the countries of the world agreed not to use something made by one of the other countries that obviously gives them an unfair advantage in practically everything, 
and instead to use Bitcoin. It would take a lot for this to happen. But the president of Zappo, perhaps not uh, Wenders himself, it says Ted Rogers, uh, is an unexpected Bitcoin bull. Perhaps all the time working at Zappo has convinced him of the value of Bitcoin. I imagine storing a few billion dollars for a few millionaires or perhaps now billionaires in an underground vault has changed his mind about the long-term value of Bitcoin. Digital gold replacing gold. Rogers further stated that there was very little doubt about one price prediction. It's not a question of when. It's not a question of when not if bit. This doesn't make any sense. It's not a question of if Bitcoin is going to become the global reserve for individuals, institutions, and government. It is going to replace gold, and it may also become a ubiquitous global currency. And it's great to see professionals like Mr. Ted Rogers, president of Zappo, saying the kind of things that we've been saying for five years. Bitcoin is awesome. Bitcoin is better than gold. Bitcoin is better than any currency currently on the market. And we've got a follow-up story. Bitgrail, Bitcoin assets taken by Italian government. Victims still fuming. But as we all know, the victims have no one to blame but themselves. Unless you're an incredibly active day trader who's always making moves, even you could afford to take your Bitcoins off the exchange at night. That's right, you don't have to sleep in fiat, you can still sleep in Bitcoin, but why not sleep in Bitcoin stored on your own Trezor or Ledger? You can even back up many of the altcoins now to the Trezor or Ledger, and additionally, you could get wallets on your computer to store those locally. If you store assets on an exchange, you're trusting the exchange. You're trusting the change exchange not to be hacked from the outside, and you're also trusting the exchange not to be hacked from the inside. And there's only a million reasons why they'd hack you, and they're not all yours. Dark web drug vendor please, pleads guilty after feds traced his Bitcoin transactions. And this is the continuation to a sad and rather stupid story. Allegedly, Gal Valeris, a 36-year-old French national, uh, was accused of selling drugs on the Silk Road. Uh, Valeris was then tricked into coming into the United States for the World Beard and Mustache competitions held in Austin, Texas. Rather than using his millions of dollars in Bitcoin to buy a new laptop when he arrived in the country, he brought his old laptop, which was full of evidence against him. The evidence was seized when he entered the country, as was Mr. Gal, Gal Valeris and his fantastic beard. Truly a tragedy, as instead of attending the Beard and Mustache Championships, he will be attending a completely different championships in prison, likely for the rest of his life. It's unbelievable that he could have just bought a new laptop and not carried any incriminating information with him across state lines. Perhaps he trusted in encryption. Perhaps he trusted in hiding in the noise. But either way, he is now pled guilty. Meltem Demore, the crypto community is ruthless. That's a good thing. We should all judge and be judged based on execution and imperial, empirical evidence, not vision and marketing dollars. And then she links to the EOS Uptime website, where you can see that EOS has had several problems with their uptime since launching their network a few days ago. Uh, excellent statement by Meltem. Cody Weddle. For sale in Colombia, purses and wallets made of Venezuelan currency. This is what hyperinflation looks like. And especially in the modern area, if you zoom in really close there, you can see the faces uh, from the previous Venezuelan currency that has now been refashioned into purses and wallets. Of course, everyone remembers during World War, at the end of World War I, that the German government you could use an entire bucket full or a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. This is hyperinflation. The dollars are worth nothing. You can use them to wallpaper your room. And many did. Top investors gambled $12 million on the blockchain equivalent of Beanie Babies. Now, sales are plummeting. That's right. Crypto Kitties raised $12 million. 
and it sounds like it's going terribly. Uh, remember, despite uh, external signs, the Crypto Kitties were not created by a clever algorithm. They were created by hand, and the randomness was probably just more of a fad and more of a temporary thing. Remember, people bought these kitties at hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars with the idea that they were rare and unique. But remember the other half of that equation. Someone has to be willing to buy it from you. Beanie babies are certainly rare and certainly unique, but is there a market for them? Originally, people would pay hundreds of dollars for these small, rare bears. Now, maybe more like $5. Still not zero, though. Jackson Palmer, today I learned if you hodl your EOS for more than three years without moving the tokens around, you lose them per their constitution. And that's a good reminder that not all copies of Bitcoin are created equal. We have a choice when it comes to which cryptocurrency you want to support. You could support Bitcoin with its locked in 21 million units. You could support Ethereum with its endless untrackable amount of units ethereum can always print more because it's meant to be used for smart contracts it's not really a, a uh, what's it called a non-fiat currency it's not really a um, i don't know i'm sure you guys have the word but um it's not strong money it's not hard money it's inflationary inflationary and the same thing for eos now eos claiming to take back your tokens if you don't move them around probably not a problem if you hold them in an exchange but if you are holding them on a hardware or paper wallet for many years not thinking about it or perhaps handed them down in an inheritance or anything like that eos will take them from you <laughs> this is terrible uh, but once again they make the rules it's their cryptocurrency they decide what they want to do. And obviously, they're going to make a lot of money. Dogecoin now has three times more transactions than Bcash. That's it. That's all I have to say about that. And just a reminder of the South Sea stock bubble. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, and I just wanted to mention it again today. Don't be like Isaac Newton. Uh, the story goes, this is the very first bubble in a stock ever. They'd never seen this before. No one knew that this was even possible. Uh, but down here, Isaac Newton invests a bit. Right here, Newton exits happy. This is where he should have stayed. But then, bad news, Newton's friends all got rich right here. So it goes up even more. Newton re-enters with a lot. The market goes up and then begins to come down. Down here, Newton exits broke and he was broke for the rest of his life. And Isaac Newton, one of the smartest people that ever lived, couldn't understand this, couldn't do the stock trading thing, didn't have good timing, whatever it was, he couldn't do it. So don't feel bad if you can't time the market either because neither could Isaac Newton. We've got one more story. Comcast's offer to buy Fox out from under Disney has MCU fans freaking out about the X-Men. And as the article says, Fandom now requires taking sides in corporate mergers. And this is a wholly new story in corporate or business history, whatever you want to call it. I don't think I've ever seen this where a single property such as the X-Men movie franchise would make people change their minds about such a large merger between Comcast and Disney. Uh, ignoring the fact that both companies have millions or perhaps even billions of dollars, uh, well, certainly billions if they're offering $65 billion for this, uh, but Despite the fact that they have billions of dollars right here, Mr. Uh, Milton Johnson says, can we start a GoFundMe for Disney? I need the X-Men in the MCU. Comcast, just, just know that if you lose, that you lose if you win. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, maybe even backdoor suggesting a boycott of Comcast uh, for buying uh, Fox to improve their company and uh, make their big uh, media monopoly even bigger. Uh, maybe Comcast could just sell the X-Men back to Disney at an enormous price. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're just tracking this story because I think it's fun. And uh, the X-Men are an important comic book series. I believe that. Uh, the price of Bitcoin currently 6486 We did have that little run up to 6716 We fell all the way to 6343 before back rising to 6486 
Uh, we've not seen anything like the 7,600 that we fell from, uh, nor the 6,120 where we stopped. Uh, we do seem to be range bound right now. And if you'd like to donate some Bitcoin to this show, you can use the QR code on your screen right now to donate any amount, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, a million bucks, whatever you got. And we'd like to thank our donor from yesterday, 0.0015318. That's 10 bucks. Thanks so much for your support. I would like to thank our Patreons. We have 19 patrons supporting the World Crypto Network at $78 a month and 83 patrons supporting Mad Bitcoins. That's me uh, at $449 a month. You can subscribe on Patreon for as much or as little as you'd like, uh, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Uh, think of it like a magazine subscription. Uh, you're just supporting the things that you enjoy. And uh, IBLB562 writes, do I have to drive to Vegas to get my copy of Para Satoshi Con Amor? And that was funny because yesterday I was joking with my brother about maybe translating the book into other languages. Uh, maybe like Andreas, I could put a copy online and people could translate it for fun. But uh, I really don't think I, it's, it's a joke. I'm not saying my book's as important as Andreas's Mastering Bitcoin book, which is a serious textbook. Uh, but I just thought it was fun uh, that he wants to read my book. And I did... Uh, uh, show the cover or the uh, starter cover. I would like to do a cover with a pink alien in a trench coat. Um, I've looked at some covers of old 80s books like uh, My Teacher is an Alien, uh, kind of young adult stuff like that that I used to read when I was a kid. And uh, something like that would be fun, but I can't, I can't really draw that well. Um, so I'm going with this simple Photoshop uh, for the first edition. But it's very possible, especially if I'm able to somehow, I don't know, sell it to a publisher or whatever. Maybe they could do a reprint uh, with a glossy, fun kind of Philip K. Dick 80s style cover, Saved by the Bell, uh, with a trench coat pink alien on the front. Uh, but that would be fun. And I am looking to options uh, for an audiobook. A lot of people have requested this. Uh, they've said nice things about my voice. Uh, so, of course, I listen after you say a nice thing. Uh, and yeah, I would like to make an audiobook. Uh, my current goal, I'm doing readings on the show, uh, but if I started doing the audiobook in sections, uh, again, it's it's difficult because I have to do it perfect, right? I have to, or nearly perfect. Uh, people are going to listen to it, theoretically. Uh, whereas the live ones here, I, I certainly screw up every once in a while. And, and nobody reads perfect. Um, maybe you know, Barbara Walters or Diane Sawyer or somebody like that. But um, I'm working on it. And uh, yeah, if I recorded it in sections, eventually, hopefully, I could get ahead of my readings here. And then I could just play you excerpts from the audiobook. How clever would that be? Uh, and I have looked, Amazon does have some kind of a publishing program called ACX uh, for authors to publish their audiobooks. Also, if you're an author, they have a great looking program called KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. And that's currently where I'm working on uh, building both the Kindle and paperback versions of my uh, little book. And it's not the best book in the world. It's not Shakespeare. Uh, it's a short, fun story uh, that I wrote for National Novel Writing Month. And uh, I don't know what else to do with it. And I think it's kind of fun. And I read the, a couple chapters here and people seem to like it, like it's a, a story and, you know, not the best or worst, but just something fun. So I'm going to go ahead and try to release it because uh, that'd be cool. And I'm going to read a little bit more of it at the end of this show. Uh, but I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines and I'm going to look at the chat and see what you guys are up to today. You can give us a call right now on Skype, World Crypto Network, all one word. I do usually have to add you first, but you can also just give it a try and call now. I know it's a little early on Sunday morning. Uh, might not be a lot of callers, but I want to try to do these every day. I want to try to get into a practice again of doing shows every day. And um, so here I am. <laughs> like, um, and yeah, if, there, if there's no calls, I'll probably go towards the reading and towards the end of the show. Um, but let's see what's going on in the chat. Oh, it looks like I only got some of the chat. <laughs> Bitcoin Core developer says that he wallpapered his office with $100 bills. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, One Man Army says that Whale Pool is watching. Uh, welcome to Whale Pool. That's a cool group. They've been doing uh, live chart chats and just talking about Bitcoin on, um, I don't know, TeamSpeak or some kind of those uh, video game type uh, communication systems for a long time. A lot of big Bitcoin fans in there, uh, although they're, they're traders, uh, so they're looking for it to go up or down. They have their own opinions on that. 
uh, but I think it's fun. <laughs> Rolf says, why do you use toilet paper as wallpaper? <laughs> uh, everyone has a negative opinion of fiat here. It's good to be with my people. And uh, they say, oh, did you lose your EOS? Um, I didn't lose my EOS. Uh, but now then another interesting thing on EOS besides this uh, three year move it around thing, which there are arguments for. They're saying that you should use it, that you should be active in their community. You should be, I don't know, investing in things. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what EOS is really supposed to be used for. Um, but uh, no, I, I didn't lose mine. I don't have any. Uh, there's another interesting story. EOS, like I said a few days ago, started off on the... Well, actually, I'm not sure. I think it started off... Uh, I'm confusing the two. It started off as an ERC-20 token. And then they had this big event where they switched you over into an actual EOS token on their main net, right? And what's so funny about this, well, funny and sad, is that uh, more than a million dollars at, at this time, and a lot of people say this crazy EOS thing could go up like all the other crazy things, um, that a million dollars in EOS was locked in my Ether wallet and will probably never be unlocked. Uh, maybe if you hacked my Ether wallet, although even then, I don't even think they have the keys uh, to those wallets. I think they're a lot more like blockchain.info uh, where you have the keys and they hold the encrypted parts. Uh, so yeah, a million dollars lost. Uh, if you have a million dollars in EOS and you're too lazy to move it out of my Ether wallet and change it on the mainnet, you could always trade that for a million dollars in Bitcoin and donate to mad Bitcoins. <laughs> Just saying. Um, EOS Connect. That's funny. Uh, they say, what a terrible project. Uh, we're not sure about EOS. Once again, though, even if we're not sure, even if we're logically questioning this thing, that doesn't mean that it's not going to go up 10 times. A lot of the times I've been disagreeing with these things. And uh, a lot of times uh, it goes crazy up. It might go crazy down at the end. Uh, but if you sell while it's crazy up, if you realize your gains, uh, you have gains, uh, undeniably. Uh, they're talking that EOS controls all your keys. This shows that EOS has full control of your tokens or keys. And I would agree with that. The, the way that they're describing the EOS network is that after three years, they could take and break your coins. In the example of Bitcoin, if we had this rule, the Satoshi coins could have been taken back. In Bitcoin, if, the, if we had this rule and you leave your coins in a hardware or a cold storage wallet for three years and you just forget about them, Maybe you go on vacation. Maybe you're a really good investor and you have the ability to forget about your investments. That's a magical skill that I wish I had. And that, yeah, basically the EOS, uh, I don't know the technical details of it, but they have some way of cracking your keys and restoring them. Or maybe they just reset them back to the original way and uh, give them back to whoever it is, the mothership of all EOS. And uh, once again, if there's a mothership of all EOS that's going to take your coins after three years, who do you think the SEC is going to sue or the uh, CFTC or whoever it is? Uh, they say there's no centralized person for Ethereum except Vitalik, and there's no centralized uh, thing that controls it except the Ethereum Foundation. What are they going to say about EOS? Uh, but then again, I'm sure it's in Switzerland or something. I'm sure they've done all kinds of uh, staging and uh, structuring uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but I, I don't know. Uh, they say the address will be the same in three years and five years. Yeah, sure, the address will be the same, but it'll be empty. <laughs> uh, they just take it. <laughs> um, ride the waves, accumulate BTC. Don't worry about the price, says CoinHawk Crypto. And I would agree with that. I would just say, don't, don't invest more than you can lose. Make sure you got money for rent. Uh, if you want to hedge, if you want to have a different position, it's easy to go all in and it's easy to pull all out. Uh, what I'm asking is for you to have some kind of a percentage strategy. It could be 90-10, it could be 70-30, it could be 30-70. Uh, but if you have some kind of a percentage strategy, at least you can control your risk. And if you feel there's too much risk, you can reduce your percentages. And if you think there's not enough risk, you can increase your percentages. But just play it on a percentage with me. Uh, give that a try. Uh, smart people lock up assets. Now you have to move them for what? I think the reason EOS is making people move the coins is to make it look like the network's being used. Uh, no doubt there'll be automated programs and special EOS wallets that move your coins every year or whatever, but you'll have to trust them. They'll have your private keys. 
Uh, for all I know, Trezor or Ledger will make a special utility to check your EOS coins and move them every two years or whatever. Uh, it's really ridiculous. But again, we're, if they're if they're successful in creating false volume for EOS, they could pump the price even more, saying that there's tons of volume because people are moving their coins. So that's one idea. The other idea is they just want the money. They think that you're not going to hear about this or you're not going to think it's real or you're going to think that's crazy or I'll just sue them afterwards or whatever. Uh, but after the money's gone, the money's gone. Uh, I don't know the reason why they did this, the, the reasoning. Uh, if there is like an EOS paper explaining it or an EOS website where they're like, we did this because of this and we have a really good reason, I would be open to reading that. I would like to hear uh, what their reason was. Uh, but I'm betting it's, yeah, transaction volume and maybe just straight up greed. <laughs> so uh, we don't know. Uh, Bitcoin Core developer says, all these companies are trying to buy out each other. AT&T is trying to buy out Time Warner Cable. Damn racketeering at its best. Uh, I agree. And I, I think one of the neat things about the Disney Comcast Time Warner story, or well, it's not even Time Warner. It's a Fox. Disney Comcast and Fox, the beautiful love triangle is that uh, as much as I hate global mega mergers, especially in the media area, I think this is a major threat to freedom. Um, if you don't know what that is, you know, it's freedom is not what the corporations tell you. It's not being a consumer. It's making your own choices. And uh, there aren't going to be any more choices uh, if all the media companies merge into one. But if Disney then tried to pull a takeover of Comcast just to get the X-Men back, I wouldn't necessarily be against it. Uh, we can unite all the companies. Heck, uh, maybe they'll take over Sony and get the original rights to Spider-Man back as well. Uh, although Spider-Man is in the MCU due to some very strange contract deals. Uh, it's so funny when they sell these properties. Uh, the only thing I can even think close to this was there was an old character in Mickey Mouse uh, that was somehow sold to NBC. And then somehow NBC traded it back to ABC and in exchange, they got Al Michaels, the broadcaster of Monday Night Football. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. I forget the character's name, but he was some uh, weird version of Mickey Mouse. Uh, for some reason, was sold to some other company. And eventually, they traded Al Michaels to get it back. <laughs> it was a wild story. But uh, yeah, that's the only uh, historical example I can think of of anything uh, of this strange. Or, or trying to get a company back to just get some obscure rights. And that's not the whole thing. Disney also wants to control Sky. Sky, I don't know much about Sky. It's a big European news channel. Maybe it's a European cable system as well. But anyway, everyone wants access to the European market. That's why they're trying to take over Fox. Uh, there was a deal on the table where uh, Comcast might have gotten Sky and Disney would have gotten the X-Men and the other movie contents uh, of Fox. But this wasn't a great deal because Disney wants Sky as well. Uh, they're both competing for the European market, and they would love to just buy a bunch of customers uh, rather than having to earn them. <laughs> so, uh, Will I accept Ether? I do have a Trezor wallet that I set up recently, and it did take Ether and Bitcoin Cash and all those other things. Uh, I'll try to post those. I don't have the QR codes or any kind of... Um, nice setup yet it's it's difficult it's easy to post one bitcoin address uh, i find that graphically etc it's hard to post a bunch of altcoin addresses but uh if you do want to donate in altcoins and let me know in the chat if there's interest in this uh, i'll put the addresses up uh, again i'm not not a big fan of the altcoins but if you've done very well and you want to share some of that with the world crypto network oh uh, we would accept that so uh, it's just we're not going to support it um, but I try to say nicer things. I try to be more reasonable. But still, I just want to be honest with my positions that I think Bitcoin's awesome and I'm not sure what these other things are for. So uh, they say in the chat, Andreas yesterday was epic. He knocked the ball out of the park. I'll have to check that out. I've seen a lot of great Andreas videos, uh, but I haven't watched that many lately. Uh, he does a great job, though. One of my favorites uh, recently, oh, not recently, but a few years ago was um, Sewer Rat and bubble boy and that bitcoin is the sewer rat and it's down there in the sewers getting all the diseases getting in fights it's got cuts on its hands you know it's out there you know roughing it up and then there's bubble boy and bubble boy is all of these private blockchains and they can't get out to the world because if your private blockchain full of medical data got out to the world the whole world would have your medical data 
unless it was encrypted, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, whereas Bitcoin is truly public, you can download all the code. If there's something wrong in the code, you can break it right there and you can have whatever the market cap is of Bitcoin, a hundred billion dollars. You can steal it all. Uh, it's the greatest bounty, the greatest hacker reward in history. Uh, if you hack Bitcoin, if you really break it, um, but unfortunately or, or fortunately, no one has, no one has broken it. I don't even know if they can. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out Andreas on uh, YouTube and Twitter. Uh, they say he's at the Panama conference. Very cool. Um, they like the audio book. Uh, they need more USD to grow more BTC. Uh, that's true both for CoinHawk crypto and for the whole market. Uh, we really do need more people to invest in Bitcoin. Uh, it feels like part of the reason that we're having the downtrend, not just because of the incredible rise to 20K, uh, which is just more of a reaction to that. Another part is that I think buying has slowed, interest has slowed. I can tell you uh, views and subscriptions, uh, Google searches are all down. All of the indicators of new people getting into Bitcoin are down. And I do think we had a lot of new people in December, January, and they all wanted to get rich quick. And the ones that figured out how to invest in Bitcoin are now uh, hopefully holding some heavy bags, or maybe they made some percentage sales on the way down. Uh, but anyway, I don't think anyone got rich quick. <laughs> so uh, that, that hurts the, uh, the marketing message of get rich quick. We still do have things like uh, the interesting report we did on the Adam Meister show the other day, where we talked to a gentleman from Argentina. And he said in Argentina, they are way into Bitcoin and they don't like their local economy and they'd much rather save their money in Bitcoin. And uh, that is, uh, that's bullish. Uh, but remember, these are still relatively small countries and quite frankly, relatively poor countries. They don't have enough money to buy enough Bitcoin to drive the market up. Uh, maybe if we had 10 Argentinas or 20 Argentinas, uh, which again, might be possible in the future. It's the kind of thing Bitcoin uh, is still in its heart kind of a virus, right? It gets into your society and pretty soon everyone's using Bitcoin. It's the kind of thing that could even spread to the country next door. If people go from a place where everyone's using Bitcoin to a place where no one's using Bitcoin and they choose to spread the word and they have the same reasons for wanting to use it, such as an inflationary currency or hyperinflation, the kind of things that makes you make uh, purses out of Venezuelan dollars rather than using them as money, uh, then they'd have a reason to buy Bitcoin and to hold it and to really understand why it was created, not just to, to buy it to get an ICO or to buy it to get an altcoin. Uh, that kind of thing. So let's see. Yeah, they say Andreas was at Global Decentralization in Panama. That sounds very wild. I only know of Panama from uh, reading about the canal. And of course, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, went through there uh, during the Spanish-American War. <clears throat> let's see. Viper is a whale. He has the biggest goat farm. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Um Whale pool would donate big time to WSM, but we're all wrecked trading. And see, that's I, what I, I mean, it's a bummer that you're wrecked, uh, point of control. That's no good. But uh, I appreciate that you uh, tell people that you're wrecked. I think it's important to tell people when you're up and to tell people when you're down. Uh, a lot of the great uh, trading people tell you how much money they've made. And then a lot of people uh, don't tell you that they've lost money. And it creates kind of this expression that you feel bad where everyone's making money but me. Everyone's a million dollars but me. And uh, that's not really true. A lot of other people are wrecked. A lot of other people held on too long, didn't sell at the top, uh, weren't taking profit. And these are all things that uh, I think we can learn from. I think if there is a Bitcoin run in the future, uh, it'll be much the same, except that this time, hopefully we can hodl and take a little bit of profit. Uh, so maybe 1% a week or 5% if it goes up 20%, uh, things like this. And uh, no one's prepared for this mentally. The stock market, if you hold Apple all year and it goes up 5%, you had a banner year. It was incredible. Uh, Bitcoin, 20% in a day, 10% down, 20% in a day, 10% down. Mentally, I'm not so sure that people are prepared to handle this kind of movement. Again, that doesn't matter. The market's not going to change. I'm not saying we should handicap the market or anything like that. I'm just saying, keep it in mind. This is uh, timing this market, especially this market, is a very difficult thing. Nobody can really do it right. Uh, at the very best, hopefully we can use percentage-based investing, go 80, 20, 
go 90-10, uh, have some options. So, and yeah, I agree with CoinHot Crypto, make something, create something like the, the book that I wrote, sell it in USD and BTC. And that's definitely something I want to do. And I think everyone else should do. I think a lot of people have talents uh, that they can use to teach people. Uh, although it's a little harder in a bear market, a while ago I was saying showing people how to buy on Coinbase, showing them how to set up a Bittrex account, move the money over there, and showing them how to put maybe you know 100 bucks into the top 10 altcoins and just see what happens. That's a skill. Uh, nobody in the world, how many people know how to do that? One you percent, know, less than that. It's very small. If you look around, like if you're in a bar or, or a restaurant, you look around the room and think about how many people in this room know about Bitcoin. Just know that it exists. And I know we're getting better on that front. And how many people have actually used it in that room? And then how many people actually have you know, 20 bucks on a hot wallet on their phone? And then how many people in that room actually have a Trezor? And if you think about this and you think that much like I thought in the past with the MP3, with the internet, with laptops, with the computer, uh, wireless, all these things, I was like, everybody's got to have this. Like I have it now. I'm a computer geek. I paid more money to get early wireless. I put, you know, PCMCI A cards in my laptop to get early wireless. I'm updating things. I'm on the edge, right? But now what I see is that everyone needs to be where I used to be. Everybody needs a laptop. Everybody needs an internet connection. And pretty soon everyone's going to need Bitcoin on their phone and they're going to need a Trezor wallet to store their money long term. And uh I just think that's the way we're going. And if you look around the room and you have that talent, and especially if you're patient, being a teacher is a lot about being patient. Uh, but if you can practice your patience and if you can appreciate the value of teaching people uh, just how to buy these things and how to sell them and how to send them around, I think that's a good job for a lot of us. Uh, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, let's see. They say they're in the mining pool. All right. Uh, Somian says... Uh, Hey, mate, I've been watching you for five years. Keep it up. Uh, thanks so much. And I think we're all in this together. Uh, we all have multiple goals. Some of us want to get rich. Some of us want enough money just to live our life and be able to choose what we want to do rather than having work choose for us. And, uh, and some of us still, in addition to those goals, not separate, is uh, we want to unbank the world. We want to give everybody a Bitcoin account. We want to give everybody a little bit of Bitcoin. And we want to give them that idea of freedom that we think about when we see Bitcoin. Uh, I see Bitcoin as something that could free the world. And I don't just mean making them rich. I mean, not taking their money away, letting them save, letting them hold. Uh, no more fees, no more bank fees, things like this. Uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, sending your money home uh, without Western Union. So uh, what stops the US government or Jeff Bezos from buying most of the BTC? Excellent question. Uh, hold on just a sec. Let's see. Well, I mean, the first thing would be uh, nothing. It's an open and free market. Uh, any whale can come in and buy all of the Bitcoin that's available on the market at any time. There's more than enough money in the United States and other economies uh, to just buy it up. But remember, if um, certainly there's some money on the over the OTC, off the over the counter exchange or whatever it is. Uh, the ones that aren't on the books. So first you would buy up all of that. And once all of that was gone, you'd have to buy on the main market. And once you started making large buys on that on the main market, the price would start going up. At that point, it would be very difficult to buy all of the BTC. I guess they could buy most, they could buy large percentages, and uh, they wouldn't necessarily get to take over the network. It's not like proof of stake where if you own all the coins, you get to make the rules for the network. And even that, I'm not sure, proof of stake's different sometimes. Uh, it's more like they would just own a lot of coins. <laughs> so uh, they would have an interest in keeping Bitcoin running. Uh, one of the ideas that's been floated for 2140, uh, when there's no more Bitcoins to mine, is that maybe a company like Amazon will mine the Bitcoin network as a public service. And with a company like Amazon, it would just be a public service. They'd also be using Bitcoin or perhaps Lightning or perhaps Lightning 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, something like that. And they would be using it for their customers. So it would be in their interest to keep it running. Uh, similarly, a government or a foundation or something could be formed uh, to mine Bitcoin and just keep it running. Uh, so we do have options for that. But yeah, it would be hard to buy all of the BTC. 
let's see uh, record on separate separate tracks and then edit in post production um i mean i have like a stereo microphone that's on two tracks and i can do some editing in uh, final cut pro things like that i use video editor most of the time um it's mainly yeah it's just mainly a matter of cutting it up into small sections and doing the small sections in a good reading voice and I've never done an audio book before, so uh, that'll be fun. I also have kind of an idea now that maybe if I do the audio book before I launch the Kindle and the paperback, I'll be able to fix more mistakes in the book because I have to read it out loud. That's one of my writing tricks, by the way, and I, it's not just mine. I was taught it, and I teach everyone that I talk to about it. But uh, if you're writing a paper for class or even a letter to a friend or an important letter for your business, read it out loud read it out loud the parts that you uh have trouble uh speaking through the parts that are tough to read take those parts out edit it uh reading aloud is my magic trick for all my writing uh, when i used to do the mad bitcoin scripts i would have a, a series i would i would write it then i would read it out loud and fix all the things that i stumbled on and then i would read it out loud for the camera so i had a, a series and a process uh, but we've had a good time hanging with the chat. Looks like we might have some phone calls coming in. Uh, let me go ahead and make sure that we're unmuted. We are. And uh, I'm accepting a couple more guys here. There are two of you. Uh, so now it's a race. Uh, whoever would like to call us back on World Crypto Network on Skype, all one word, uh, we'll have you a call as a caller. And then a second caller uh, will have you next. Uh, but go ahead and give us a call right now. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Um, Nicholas from Portland. All right, Nicholas. Uh, what's going on for you today in Bitcoin? What are your thoughts today? Um, um, what's your idea on the hyper Bitcoinization of of Bitcoin itself? Do you think we'll eventually arrive to some time where you know there's going to be this mad rush into cryptocurrency? Or do you think we're kind of a ways from that point? I, I think, um, well, first, the, the idea of hyper-Bitcoinization, and uh, I used to call it total Bitcoin adoption, uh, but just in general, uh, to me and to a lot of the other uh, people that they'll probably call Bitcoin maximalists, uh, there's this point in my mind where Bitcoin goes into the S-curve, and the S-curve points straight up, right? So we're going along parabolic, blah, blah, blah. Then all of a sudden we start going straight up because people are just getting in. The, the virus is out. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, it's like emails. Like you can't, you can't avoid it anymore. I tried yeah. not to do it and I avoided it. So it goes crazy up. Bitcoin's going up hundred percent a day. And you're looking at your bag of altcoins and you're like 5%, 10%. I want hundred percent. And at this point, at least in my mind, uh, even the, the hardest core altcoin supporter gives up and buys Bitcoin. And this drives the price up even more. And then the price just keeps going up. So uh, I do believe that will happen. I believe that eventually Bitcoin, everyone will just wake up to Bitcoin. And it's going to take a different amount of time. And everyone's going to have to reject it first. And they might say horrible things about it. And might have to take them back later and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I do think we're going there. Uh, the question of the time is the real question. Uh, a lot of people are really excited about 2020. Uh, maybe they've never seen a halvening before, and they think that if we can go through another halvening, the price will double, the general public will get involved, the whole thing will blow up. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that it's going to be as soon as 2020, but I'd put that on the list as a possibility. Uh, the real question is five years, 10 years, 20 years. And uh, sadly, recent events like the Tether manipulation, the possibility that many of the major CEOs and exchanges in Bitcoin collaborated together to run up the market, uh, that doesn't help our cause. Uh, you have to kind of do this like the atomic uh, clock, right? The countdown to uh, atomic destruction. They move yeah. the, the number every once in a while. So I would say uh, having the Tether thing, that moves us back like two minutes on the atomic clock. Like if it was going to be two years from now, it's going to be five years from now. It's just, it's a, it's a drag, right? I still think we're going there. I think we're going there a little slower. So you, you touched a little bit on the alt market. Um, one of the things I follow as a trader myself, um, I trade shit coins just to accumulate Bitcoin. Sure, but sure. one of the things that's been concerning has been the Bitcoin dominance over the last uh, six months to a year. It's 
I think originally at its like highest point, it was around 80% and it's collapsed. And since over the last two, three months, it hasn't been able to surpass 40% as having the total Bitcoin dominance. And that's been a little concerning. And, you know, I kind of just traded charts and, you know, mm-hmm. but I don't know what your thoughts were on Bitcoin being able to surpass that Bitcoin dominance level. I, I, I think you already touched about it in your previous response saying that eventually it's going to be another uh, Bitcoin FOMO like we saw back in September through November where Bitcoin was just eating up everything. Um, also, I, also, I think uh, Bitcoin dominance is a really tough number for Bitcoin to defend. All right. Essentially, what we're saying is this uh, unadvertised project with no CEO is competing against all these incredibly well-funded startups with full marketing and full CEOs and full en- uh, and engineering teams, uh, the whole thing. Uh, so do I think that a flashy, attractive, sexy project with a lot of cool people working on it is going to take, you know, 5% of Bitcoin away? I think so. Uh, do I think Bitcoin will get it back in the long run? Maybe their project doesn't work. Maybe they over-promised and under-delivered. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll get it back in the long run. But uh, I can't stop, or, or Bitcoin itself can't stop any of these flashy things uh, from taking away some of that percentage. So uh, that's that's the way I understand that number. But. Very cool. Yeah, I don't think I had anything else. I just wanted to call in and say hello and thank you for uh, indulging in some of my inquiries. Well, well, good stuff, Nick. Thanks so much for the call and uh, give us a call anytime. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Yeah, a lot of people have uh, you know Ooh. questions like this, and uh, feel free to answer them or ask them. Uh, sometimes I might not know the answer. You might not find my answer satisfying, uh, but it's important to ask these questions. And let's just get this out there. And uh, if you, there we go, another caller. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, uh, it's Bitcoin Viper. Let me just mute the YouTube stream for a sec. Sure. Hey, yeah, um, Bitcoin Viper here from the uh, the Whale Pool Team Speak down under in Australia. How are you going? Doing good. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Look, I was actually just listening to your conversation about the um, about the Bitcoin dominance, and I personally think that um, we should be looking at um, you know creating like a top ten and leaving the dominance there because every new coin that joins, we're getting hundreds of new coins every couple of weeks. It feels, and those coins, even um, if they don't, if one coin sells a dollar worth of its you know tokens, and there's a hundred million tokens, it has a market cap of $100 million, even though only $1 has moved into that token's ecosystem. So Bitcoin dominance will continue to fall just based on that with every new the new coin that comes in. So I feel that maybe we should be looking at maybe, you know, a top 20 coins and we'll peg the Bitcoin dominance just to that, much like they do on, you know, stock indexes. And this this has a little to do with the idea of coin market cap, doesn't it? Everyone looks at the market cap of these coins, but maybe that's not the best indicator. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, just to, to look at maybe an index with, you know, the top 50 coins and we just look at the Bitcoin dominance just based on that. And we just ignore all these new coins coming in because they're just diluting the dominance um, with with no money. It's real, no actual money that's gone into their ecosystems. That's my. Uh, anyway. Now, the, the chart that I enjoyed that came out maybe a couple of weeks ago, it showed all of the old altcoins from like four years ago. Then it showed their percentage against Bitcoin. And even Litecoin, it had incredible losses against Bitcoin over a long enough timeline, over four or five years. And they had other things like Terracoin and Primecoin and Megacoin and Feathercoin. Incredible, incredible losses, horrible loss. And you wonder why, you know, people are critical of the altcoin markets. A lot of us have seen these things go up and go down before. Uh, so it's interesting yeah, we, we have that kind of memory. Yeah. Look, yeah, I mean, I've been around in the crypto space for about five years now. And we've seen, I mean, as of you, obviously, a long time. And, mm-hmm. and we've seen coins come and go. Um, and I think just like the guy that was here earlier, I mean, they're really just using trading shit coins just to accumulate more Bitcoin. And my my sort of opinion on that is just buy more Bitcoin, just keep buying Bitcoin <laughs> um, and don't gamble it. I, I think that, you know, we could see in the next sort of five years, you know, $100,000 Bitcoin, $200,000 Bitcoin. And is it really worth the risk of of gambling something that could be such you know that could be worth so much money um trying to accumulate more when you know if 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 it does actually end up being worth that amount um 
you're never going to have to work again anyway. And what you have now will probably be enough to get you through, um, get you through, you know? Yeah, that's the real question, isn't it? Everyone wants the next Bitcoin, the new Bitcoin, the one they can get in early on. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, I think it's very difficult for people to just buy the old Bitcoin. Uh, they see the incredible cost of it. They see how little they're getting in, uh, you know, decimals. And um, it's tough on them, especially when you go to Coinbase, right? Um, excuse me. If you go to um, Coinbase and they offer you, I don't know now, four, maybe five different random altcoins. And last time I was there, they just had the logos and the names. I don't even think they had a paragraph explaining that like this is a smart contracts platform or uh, this is uh, whatever the hell Ethereum Classic is or, you know, those kind of things. Uh, you're just choosing randomly. And a lot of people choose on the price. They're like, well, a Litecoin was the cheapest, so I bought that. And sometimes it works. They make money. And sometimes it doesn't work. I think the saddest one is when people go in and they want to get Bitcoin and then they come out with Bitcoin Cash because it was cheaper. And say what you will about the project, but when you confuse the names like that, that's what you get. And then people send it to the wrong type of address and it gets lost. And it's just a disaster. So absolutely i mean people do have this real unit bias when it comes to these coins and i think the one thing that i try and explain to you know to noobs when i'm talking about it um when they go oh, just it's so expensive i just say look there's only ever going to be 21 million of them created there's 33 million millionaires in america which means if every millionaire in america wanted to own a bitcoin there's simply not enough to go around it's such a scarce resource um, and I don't believe it's expensive at all. I, I personally think it's cheap when you look at Apple with their $300 billion in the bank account um, could buy every single Bitcoin in existence twice over. Um, it's, it's cheap, you know, I think, I think it's cheap and I think it's got, um, it, yeah, it's got a long way to go. But obviously we all, we all think that otherwise we wouldn't be here. That would be pretty cool if Apple bought every Bitcoin available. <laughs> I've been wondering what they're going to do with that money for a long time. And uh, that's one of the best uh, ideas I've heard so far. <laughs> like, that would be good. We need to pitch that. And, um, all of us guys in Whirlpool are enjoying listening to your show. So keep it up. You're doing a good job. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate you guys joining us uh, from Whalepool. And uh, we're trying to do these shows more often. And the idea being that uh, we just talk straight to the audience. And it's kind of like the callers are the gold here. And we're panning for the gold. And uh, a lot of good callers out there. And it's, it's just so fun because people are all over the world. I've talked to people in Turkey and Ireland and uh, Canada and just everywhere. And it's so amazing uh, that people could listen to my little show on YouTube uh, all over the world. Because uh, certainly I don't promote it in Turkey or anything like that. Um, but I, I appreciate them listening. So. Cool. Well, thanks again for having me on. Thanks so much for the call. Give us a call anytime. Will do. Bye-bye. And you can give us a call now on Skype at World Crypto Network, all one word. Uh, it's 8.53. We have a little bit of time left till 9 a.m. We'll try to keep the show going till then uh, if we have calls and topics to talk about. Uh, we have 300 live viewers. Thanks so much for giving us a thumbs up and a share. Uh, that really helps people find the show. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe down below. We have about 70, 75% of people subscribe to our shows. And subscribing just helps you find out if we do new, show, new shows in the future, and you can check them out. Also, they have a little bell next to the subscription button. If you click that, it will notify you when we go live. And sometimes that doesn't really work. And if you really want the notifications, follow at Mad Bitcoins or at World Crypto Network on Twitter. Uh, there's a lot of crypto stuff happening on Twitter these days. I've been there a long time. I like Twitter. I still think of it as a short message service, even though they doubled the size of the messages. Um, but uh, it's still fun. I have a good time on Twitter. Uh, so join us on Twitter if you're not there already. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is $6,511. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Cool. Yeah. I was, oh, oh, I got to mute the uh, YouTube. Definitely. <laughs> uh, I'd rather not share that info. That's I just fine, man. ask a, a question about what your thoughts were on the connections between Circle and Monero and Bitmain. Mm. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I think about that a lot and it sounds, there's something uh, sketchy about it. 
Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I don't really know anything, but uh, maybe you can tell me more. The main thing I've heard is uh, uh, linking those partners together is that Bitmain had made a copy of Monero and that they were going to mine it with their ASICs and that Bitmain had also made special Monero ASICs, but then the Monero developers changed the way that Monero worked so it wouldn't work with their ASICs. Uh, so in that way, I do see a lot of competition and I think it was an especially bold move by the Monero developers to make their coin, at least for now, ASIC proof. And then if they're willing to change it again in the future, uh, I think that's a strong stance. I'm interested in that. But what about Circle? How does that tie in? Right. So at more or less the same time as those uh, forks were going on where uh, the Monero team uh, changed the algo so that the ASICs couldn't uh, work properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Monero basically, you know, they sh they spun off all this classic, original, blah, 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 blah nonsense. It's pretty mm -hmm. much like the same scam they were up to with this Bcash thing. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, too. I think there's going to be a Litecoin classic and an Ethereum classic. There already is. And uh, all these things. I really think from a mining perspective, uh, I hate to, you know, I'm going to reference Silicon Valley again, but why not just make a copy of everything? Uh, you're in China. Do what you want, right? <laughs> yeah, but they're they're trying to saturate things and, you know, just try to co-opt the brand. Mm -hmm, but um, also, it was interesting that around the same time you heard about this news of Bitmain investing in Circle. And that... Um, oh, wait. That that uh, and Circle is going to offer Monero on their platform, so that just seems like super weird. Yeah, I mean, part of the part of the thing is that I know at least from the articles I've read that Bitmain has four billion dollars in profits. Uh, so for me, at a very you know base level, I say, well, Bitmain's going to invest in everything, uh, whether I like Bitmain or not. Uh, I, I if I had that that kind of money, I would have to invest in almost everything. Right. I mean, you'd want to have a little bit of exposure to any kind of company or any kind of crypto you could get in. And Circle, Goldman Sachs, this is going to be a very, very big project in crypto. So I'm not surprised to see Bitmain in there. Uh, it is interesting to see if they are mining Monero. Uh, what I would keep an eye out for is if they're going to offer this uh, Monero Classic or whatever it's called. Uh, that's that's where I would get more conspiratorial. Uh, and then it gets even worse if they're going to offer Monero Classic, but not Monero. Uh, something like that would be really bad. Uh, but again, it would be their market. They would be making the choice not to make money or to make money. And that they're, they're a private company and there's and there's not much we could do to them other than uh, shake our fist and complain, you know. Uh, it was my understanding that Circle was going to be offering this the straight up Monero and that uh, probably Bitmain is going to shill all those shit forks in their market. But I don't know. I'm just speculating. But it was also interesting that, you know, Jihan Wu and Circle were sort of making that announcement about the investment at Consensus. Mm -hmm. And also that was where they announced they're going to develop that the stable coin. Or what are they going to call it? USD coin or something like yeah. that. Yep. USDC. Sort of like the, <laughs> the Tether equivalent. So I just if you guys if you had opinions on stable coins and Tether and some of the Tether issues and that whole realm of stuff i'd be interested in hearing what you guys think sure uh, i'll recap the the tether scene a little bit uh mainly i was against tether when it came out uh for me it always looked like something that would be linked to a bank account and i would have to trust that you had the bank account and then i would have to trust that the bank account didn't get seized uh, so compared to bitcoin where i don't have to make any of those trust uh, choices uh, i was very much in favor of bitcoin uh, but I couldn't stop Tether, and no one could stop Tether. They had a lot of money, and they built a big thing. Uh, I am concerned about the Tether uh, Bitfinex manipulation story. I don't think that it's over. I think that that's bullshit, man. Come on. Yeah, I uh, there's a 66 page paper on the University of Texas tracking the movement on the blockchain. Dude, dude, some oh, article. Yeah. Dude, yeah. I write an article with a title, and that means I it what I said is true. I mean, it's, it's not don't... an article though. It's a research paper. Like, you yeah, read the re research paper, and then you say uh, did hey, they I fake all this evidence. That seems like a lot of work. Faking all this evidence and faking this research paper. 
Uh, and then when you put into the other side of it, that crazy. Yeah, I'm not concern. saying that what they wrote in the research paper is inaccurate. I'm saying that the conclusions that they drew from it weren't necessarily accurate. Okay. So what are the conclusions? Tether just accidentally manipulated the market? No, it didn't manipulate the market. It had it had to do with the arbitrage in markets during the run up. You know, people okay. were arbitraging legit. Sure. Bitfinex and uh, the Korean exchanges and GDAX. And why do you think the network got so clogged up? Because people were arbitraging the spread between the you know the kimchi premium, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, I take that as an alternate point of view. I'm open to that. Uh, for me, though, it really just tied it up. It made sense that the twenty thousand run would be speculative especially when I read that second article about the crypto cartel, uh, which I take with a grain of salt. But also, if you think about all these guys, they don't like governments, they don't like regulations, they don't like following rules. And at the same time, they like Bitcoin and they have a lot. Uh, so they have a lot of reason to drive up the price. So yeah, no, I'm not I'm not uh, doubting that there's a tremendous amount of manipulation in these markets. I'm just saying that that specific attempt to try to suggest that Tether is the source of manipulation, I find dubious. But um, nonetheless, um, I mean, I think the biggest uh, problems with manipulation does, I mean, it, this cartel, the conspiracy theory, yeah, maybe it's possible. But at the end of the day, the issue is that the concentration of Bitcoin, you know, in terms of the number of wallets, you know, I mean, it's you can't really say for sure. But everyone knows that the biggest whales have just like a ridiculous amount of Bitcoin. And that makes it easy to manipulate the markets. Definitely. And that's especially true for the smaller altcoin markets. Uh, we saw a lot of altcoins getting pumped. Even old dead projects were getting pumped. And it's just there's so much money and they don't know what to do with it. And they can overwhelm a market and then they can make more money. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, all right. Cool, man. So uh, thanks for answering some of my questions and uh, appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks for the call and uh, give us a call anytime. For sure. And I uh, just want to say I really appreciate the caller for sharing his uh, alternative view of the Tether thing. I don't know everything that's happening. I don't know that that article is true or that research paper is true. And I appreciate other points of view. Uh, if there is an other point of view that I think makes more sense uh, than my current point of view, I will consider switching to that point of view. Uh, so that's why I think sharing information is so important and that we all have different opinions and we all have different backgrounds and we can bring this together to analyze the information together. Uh, so I think that's really good when we can do that. Uh, let's check in with the chat again. They're talking. Let's see. Record separate tracks. EOS. Uh, feels like we're going to the moon soon. <laughs> Maybe on one of those virgin flights. <laughs> At least you could get to space. I wonder what ever happened. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but years ago, uh, a flight attendant for Virgin Atlantic uh, had a bunch of Bitcoin. Some uh, uh, passenger had told him about it and he did the good thing. He bought in, he put a grand in or whatever. And then he had you know, tons of money and he gave it to the Virgin guy. I forget his name, Richard Branson. And he gave it to Richard Branson for one of those rides into space. And everybody was always like, oh, you could have held it and you'd have Bitcoin and maybe you could get two or three space rides. And, and, and maybe he could have. Uh, but what I think is sad right now is that guy gave up his Bitcoin years ago and uh, Branson still hasn't given him a ride in space. <laughs> what if the guy passed or something? What if his airplane went down? I don't know. Uh, funny story, though. I, I'd love to hear an update on the, the Virgin, uh, Virgin Atlantic uh, stewardess who was going to fly into space. <laughs> That's a cool story. Uh, they say, you will not lose your EOS in three years. This is total FUD. EOS domain names can be lost after three years of inactivities, not your tokens. Okay, so Mug Hat is disagreeing with Jackson Palmer here. Uh, I did get that information from Jackson. I don't have a second source. And he is saying that it's the EOS domain names that can be claimed. Uh, personally, I, I don't know that much about EOS or the domain names, so I assume you buy those with EOS tokens. Maybe you invest your tokens in there. I don't know. Maybe it's similar to what Jackson said, or maybe he's uh, slightly off. Uh, but thanks, Mughat, for more information on EOS. Uh, 
I wish I could travel back in time and, and put that over the other one or something uh, so that you would know. But um, I do think it's interesting. So we're checking out the chat. Uh, Apple should buy and hold. <laughs> Hodl. Uh, there we go, Apple. Uh, people want to see a huge purge to drop the uh, the altcoins, then to the moon. And uh, yeah, I mean, if that's if that's what works, I mean, sadly, I've seen these altcoins go down before and then bounce right back up. Uh, some of them, some of them go down and die. Some of them go down and bounce back up. Uh, so I don't know about that, but, uh, that's great. This <laughs> Zach says, the thing I like best about YouTube crypto is you can take a few months off and not watch any videos and then come back and nothing is new. And everyone just says the same stuff. That is pretty funny. I was thinking about, uh, it wasn't too long ago. We were at 6,000 and we were totally thrilled about it. We were like, oh my gosh, Bitcoin's at 6,000. It was at 1,200 for so long. Uh, even I gave up, sold some at 1,200. Oh, 6,000, so nice. And and then now it's, you know, we're down to 6,000. So everybody's like, oh, I'm so sad at 6,000. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> it's still, still six times up from the 1,200 pretty much. <laughs> so uh, what should you talk about if you call? You could talk about anything you want. Uh, we have the phone lines are open right now on Skype, World Crypto Network, all one word. Uh, we had a couple of calls this morning. And again, if you don't, I just ask you, uh, what's your name and where you're calling from? Because it's a nice way to do a talk show. Uh, if you want to say, I'm John from New York City, uh, I'm not going to check uh, that your name is John and that you're from New York City. Uh, FYI, though, on Skype, it does show me whatever you choose to be your display name. So I might make a mistake and call you by, you know, Fred or whatever. Um, but if you want to change your display name to John from New York City, uh, I would never know. So uh, you can be anonymous and call in. You just have to have a Skype account. So you can keep one of those and make one of those on your own. Maybe get a get a VPN or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Moneros has no abilities to scale. Even Fluffy Pony knows that. You know what I like about Fluffy Pony is he seems to tell the truth. Uh, I remember he was joking about how much Monero he was going to sell when it went up and he had a whole scale of how he was going to sell it. And now the crazy thing went up and he's probably selling it. Uh, seems like a good guy. Everybody that meets him at the convention says he's great. Uh, he's one of the few people I haven't met uh, in this space yet. I would like to meet Fluffy Pony. He seems like a nice guy. Uh, I don't know his real name though. Maybe it's Joe. <laughs> I would, I like to call people by their real names, <laughs> but uh, if they want to be a secret I'll call him Fluffy Pony then. <laughs> but uh, oh, it looks like I'm missing the Germany versus Mexico match on the World Cup. Uh, I used to be in the World Cup, into the World Cup. I'd been watching the U.S. team since about 2000. I remember the old Brazilian teams that used to dominate, and I was very confused about how uh, Ronaldo had switched from Brazil to Portugal. Uh, but it turns out it's a different Ronaldo. <laughs> so. Um, I watched in the great days of Brazil, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, and uh, I forget the other one, uh, but they're the three R's and they were fantastic, and incredible soccer players. It's uh, very disappointing that the US is not in it this year. Uh, my backup country would probably be the Netherlands to root for. I like the orange. I had a great time in Amsterdam, met a lot of good people. Uh, Netherlands also not in it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm back to pretty much rooting for Germany. Uh, some of my ancestors are there from there. Some of my ancestors are from Portugal. Um, Portugal's also doing really well. At Ronaldo got a hat trick, three goals all on his own. Uh, but you guys probably don't want to talk about soccer, but it is a big deal, the World Cup. A lot of people are excited about the future. They're excited about soccer. They just love it. Uh, they want to see me do an interview with Jimmy Song. That sounds good. I haven't talked to Jimmy in a while. Uh, a few years ago, I did a great interview with Jimmy about Bitcoin scaling. You can check that out on the Mad Bitcoins channel. Uh, I did a whole series of interviews that week with uh, a lot of uh, notable people in Bitcoin. And uh, we were basically trying to stop the fork. Uh, we were saying, can't we come together? Can't we have some kind of agreement? Can't we have a unified Bitcoin? And uh, as it was, we kind of stopped the fork, but then Bitman got the fork ready to go anyway. And someone decided to go with the fork. And then we had the fork anyway. And now we have Bcash and all this nonsense. But uh it was a very cool series of interviews, and I think you should check it out. I, I interviewed Roger Ver, Eric Lombroso, Jimmy Song, uh, a lot of great people on the show. Uh, let's see. There's some people being critical of tone in the chat. Uh, I'm just going to let that go, um, but you're welcome to say whatever you want. It's a free country. And uh, let's see. 
I'm sure a hundred percent. It's the one percent who are manipulating the market. Tether thing is BS. I don't trust their media sources. All a bunch of lies. So there's her opinion there. Dino Rex Gaming HD. Very cool. Uh, EOS is a meme. SEC is going to eat EOS for lunch. And remember, John Oliver famously came out against EOS on his show uh, last week tonight, and he talked a lot. He showed a lot of pictures of Brock Pierce, uh, who used to be uh, largely associated with EOS. He's dialed that back a bit. And it was funny to me because all the things that uh, John Oliver said about EOS, I said about Ethereum when it came out. And uh, I've, I've told you now, at least in, in this short term, uh, the price of Ethereum is still up. Uh, people are still building on it. And uh, we were pretty wrong about it. We thought it was a fake crowd sale. And we still do think it's an illegal security. Um, but uh, the same thing with EOS. And it'll be, I'm curious to see how John Oliver's uh, criticisms and predictions turn out. Uh, he went out on a limb there, like I think we went out on a limb. And uh, we'll see if he's rewarded for that or punished. So. Let's see, 60,000 is exaggerated, but maybe 20,000 to 30,000. That's all right. Uh, I do like that that guy is uh, sticking with his huge prediction. Uh, that's, uh, that's ballsy. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's right or not. I don't know if he has good information to uh, justify sticking with his position, uh, but I like that he's doing it. But then again, you know, I'm just bullish about Bitcoin. I just like Bitcoin, uh, but I'm a lot more long term these days. Coin Junkie's real name is Bruce. Bruce Wayne. <laughs> uh, people are talking about crystal ball predictions. And remember uh, what it is about these charts. And I think about this whenever I play fantasy baseball or fantasy football, they're only showing me the performance in the past. A player hit 50 home runs over the first half of the season, but he hits 10 in the second half. Um, so it's, uh, you got to watch out for those charts and they do give you some idea and they do give you an idea of trends. And I, I'm afraid we're in a bearish trend now and I don't like that, but, uh, I can't disagree with it. I can't change it just by my own beliefs. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would just hold on. I would, the, the main problem that I have is that, uh, let's acknowledge some things. Thinking is hard. Uh, thinking is hard. Holding on to your money is hard. Investing your money is hard. Taking risks is difficult. So if there was a way where I could outsource my thinking and I could just watch somebody on TV like that guy from Mad Money, Jim Cramer, or some other predictor, and he has a crystal ball. And what's great about that is that he does all my thinking for me. I don't have to think anymore because I just trust whatever he says. And he looks at the charts and he puts the lines on them and the numbers. And he says, if it goes up to here, this, and if it goes down to here, this, and he makes his predictions and I just do whatever he says. And now I don't have to think. Uh, the problem with this is that I've outsourced my brain to someone else. And when I watch this, the show to see what my brain thinks, uh, sometimes my brain don't think good. Or sometimes my brain makes mistakes. It's the hardest job in the world and it's not possible to predict perfectly or to predict uh, like a crystal ball or like magic. So when you outsource your thinking, I worry that you're not doing any thinking at all. Hello, caller, you're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hey, this is uh, Peter from uh, the Netherlands. Hi. Hey, Peter, uh, what's on your mind about Bitcoin today? Uh, yeah, I was curious, what do you think uh about the uh, price when when will it um, yeah go up uh, you know when when do you think that a large amounts of money uh, will will enter the market caps do you think etf is um, is needed or i did see yesterday somebody said uh, on twitter that the only thing that would pull bitcoin out of this negative or uh, bear trend is the approval of the bitcoin etf and I definitely, I would put that on the board as possible good news for Bitcoin. We can make basically make a list of good news and bad, bad news, right? Excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, bad news, like yesterday or two days ago, Ethereum could have been declared a security. As much as I think it's a security, even if it, even if it was declared a security, that would crash the Ethereum market, crash the ICO markets. And as much as we like Bitcoin, it would crash the Bitcoin market too. Uh, so there's potential the, the, the bad dollar, news. The dollar market of Bitcoin. Of yep, yeah, the dollar price of it. You'd still be worth one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin. The network would work fine. 
um, but the price of it uh, would be in trouble because of this security thing. Uh, so we can look out and we can say, what are the possible good news things for Bitcoin? And J.W. Weatherman had a good one. He said, what if Amazon takes Bitcoin? And again, we don't have any evidence for these things, but we could just say someday that might happen. Uh, the same thing with China. China has banned Bitcoin and ICOs. Someday they might change their mind. So we have Amazon, China, the ETF. Uh, the other things, possible good things, viral adoption of Bitcoin, just kind of some kind of mainstream virus. Normal people just start getting into it. Everybody wants it. Everybody at your office is installing wallets on their phone and trading around $5 for lunch. And it just takes off, right? So we have adoption. Um, other than that, I don't know. We have to continue brainstorming of other good news things. Uh, as far as the chart, uh, sadly, I've I've become into the chart watchers where they're saying things like it has to stay over this number and if it goes over that number. Uh, so we need a big turnaround uh, to break this thing. We'd need to go to like back to seven or 8,000 pretty quickly and then stay there and then go up higher and those kinds of things. Uh, so to do that, we'd need either a very large event uh, or maybe something like institutional money buying in or Goldman Sachs buying in or some kind of exchange buying in, some kind of stock market thing. Uh, somebody needs to buy more Bitcoin than they're currently buying uh, for some reason to turn the market around. Uh, so I, I don't know when that's coming. The main thing that I feel, I'm still super bullish about Bitcoin. I think it's the world's money. I think it's great, uh, but I think we're on a slower timeline than we used to be. I used to feel that maybe two years, five years. Now it's more like five years, 10 years. So. Okay, for for uh, that that it is a worldwide currency, uh, five five years. Yeah, after the halving. Did you think it was two years uh, before and now uh, five years? I, I'd say pretty much so. I mean, I'm not, I'm never concrete on these things. I never really know that no. it's going to go in 2020. I don't have that, but no. just my general feeling is just the tether manipulation story kicks it back a little for me. Uh, I used to say, well, it's it's always it was twenty thousand once. It's always kind of going to be twenty thousand. Uh, but now it's like we need some major change to come in and to turn the market back in the right direction. And uh, maybe the change just comes because we hit a true bottom here. Uh, if we look at the charts the last time that we really had good volume in a buy, uh, well, I'm not seeing it here, but it, I think it was around 3,000. Uh, we had some good volume there, but some good volume at 1,200. Uh, maybe if we go back to one of those prices, people just decide that it's so cheap that they overbuy. Uh, that could help turn it around. Uh, but the main thing we're looking for here is just a real bottom. And some people think this might be the bottom because if you line uh, this low, that low, and this low together, and even this this one here kind of, uh, they all line up. So maybe this is the bottom, people are hoping. And if it's so, we've tested it too, and this is the third time. Uh, but if we break through this and then we're looking for a new bottom, maybe down here at 3,000, uh, maybe even lower, people have said 1,200. Uh, the big fear for me... Yeah. Even though the the chartists are all like, oh, it's it's three thousand and then the moon, and it's twelve thousand and then the moon. Uh, to me, I also just worry that the confidence in Bitcoin will be lost if we go to three thousand, or it'll be lost if we go to twelve hundred, and we'll see some real pain. And when people talk about you know killing the altcoins, that kind of thing, if Bitcoin goes to two thousand, then Bitcoin goes to twelve hundred, Bitcoin goes back to three hundred, uh, then all the altcoins go back to like twenty cents. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, would that kill them or would you just buy more? The king. I don't know. Sorry, go ahead, Peter. They, they are all connected to the king, uh, Bitcoin. Uh. There it is. Absolutely. And if the king goes down, uh, all the other pieces go as well. Uh, interesting that you uh, that you think it like that. I I, I heard it, uh, that uh, someone said it had to go to uh, two and a half K. Because mm -hmm. we didn't, uh, yeah, went went back to that level, so that was the bottom. But yeah, maybe it's six k. Yeah, I really, I, I, I don't have uh, any idea what the what these charts. Uh, well, and, and you know? part of it is charts, and part of it is emotion. So if we go back to three k, because the charts say we have to go back to three k, and the trader guys all follow the charts, and they, in a, in a way, that's self reinforcing, right? If they're all looking at the same lines. And they're like, oh, 3K is the line. Then they're all going to make a choice based upon that line. They're all just following it like lemmings. Um, but the mm -hmm. lemmings is one thing. The real issue is the mob, right? The whole big crowd of people who are like, oh, my God, it went to this. I'm out. 
And if that happens enough, uh, then the money drains out of this. And if they stop uh, reinvesting or they stop dollar cost averaging, if they stop everything, if they just say, hey, I'm going to wait on the sidelines for six months, see how this goes, uh, then we go back down. And then we go lower than their lines, even because the emotions change. So uh, there's a lot to really try to understand this. It's, it's news, it's charts, it's emotions, uh, it's outside forces. Uh, if Amazon decides 3000 is cheap enough and they're buying it all, and after they've bought whatever they want to buy, they're going to make an announcement and they're going to pump the price and then they're going to feel really good about their buys and then they're going to use it. Uh, that could turn the whole thing around. I don't have any information that that's going to happen. I don't know if there's a reason for Amazon to change that. I have no problem buying things on Amazon right now. Uh, it doesn't need to be easier or faster or anything. Um, but if they just decide, you know, get a bug up their thing and decide it's time uh, or they have some kind of strategic reason for doing this, uh, they could very well, well turn this whole thing around. Yeah, the thing is, I guess we, we all don't know uh, what's going to happen. That's right. It's and you just, have to, you just have to judge your risk tolerance. How much are you willing to risk? Hopefully, if you've got a good job and you're just investing on the side, this is a hobby for you. Uh, hopefully, you still have a savings account, maybe some traditional investments. It's tough to hold those. No, I sold, sold, them on, big, uh, <laughs> sold them all because I don't trust the fiat uh, currency uh, system anymore. Sure. Well, and the, the gains in Bitcoin have been incredible. I, I know I have some money that they gave me for my old job, and I just kind of left it there because it's pre-tax or whatever. And uh, that would be so much more money if I bought Bitcoin with it. Oh, my God. Um, but again, I was trying to be a reasonable person and trying to hold some backup money uh, in case. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that I lost there. I think that I had a, a safety position, and I still now have a safety position. So. Yeah, it's a bit of a less uh, percentage uh, per 20 years. Eh? It's like 8% uh, twenty uh, over 20 years when yeah. you do it with the fiat uh, currency system. That, that's it. That's it. I mean, I have money in uh, organizations. I'm, I'm doing pretty well for what they gave me originally. And I've got some tech stocks like uh, Facebook and Amazon. Or, and I don't have Amazon anymore. I wish I did. I have like Facebook and um, Google and Apple. And then I have uh, my ugly dog is Twitter, uh, but Twitter came back recently. I just, I wish I'd bought more at the bottom, but I just, I'm not very uh, uh, hands-on with my stocks anymore. I just kind of leave them there. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I had a uh, strategy of uh, obligations, e ETFs mm -hmm. and worldwide and um, the biggest uh, companies ETF worldwide. And then you had to um, take your uh, age, like I'm 30, and then 30% um, uh, in ETFs uh, in, in organizations, and then 70 like uh, obligations, uh, ETFs, both worldwide. And then when you're 50, then you do 50-50, because uh, yeah, obligations are, are less risk, eh? but yeah, they, they have 1% uh, um, yeah, annual 1%. And so that's, but that was a strategy that you have um, combined eight uh, percent over twenty twenty five years or something, man. That sounds that sounds like a good strategy. And I'm, I'm definitely in favor of anyone splitting their money up into different piles, whether it's a pile of altcoins and a pile of cash, or a pile of stocks and a pile of Bitcoin, uh, whatever you want to get. Just split it up, do a percentage thing, be in more more than one thing. Uh, spread it around, even though I still think Bitcoin's the best. Maybe you want to be 90-10 into Bitcoin, uh, but putting that 10 into something else, uh, that could really save your butt uh, if this doesn't work out. As, as long as we don't uh, let it at the bank. Uh. There it is, unless it's all <laughs> seized. All from, take the whole thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, leaving your money in the bank <laughs> is like leaving your money in an exchange, but you have the same problem if you keep your money at home in a safe or whatever it is. Uh, it's very difficult to hold on to things of value, don't you think? It's a cotton, huh? It's a printed cotton money, the uh, <laughs> currency. Sure, it could get eaten by bugs. I'd rather, uh, rather wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> it is similar to clothes, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much for the call, Peter, and uh, better luck next time for the Netherlands, huh? Yeah. Maybe a uh, next World Cup we can root for the U.S. and the Netherlands yeah. together. So. <laughs> Yeah, I heard it. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, put it a uh, lot. Uh, Mexico, uh, Germany. When when you said it, and I thought it was a good, um, a good um, thing. You the thing you you 
Sasha, uh, you you uh, you uh, let us show uh, about the Newton. You yeah, know? yeah, uh, I think that's good to mention because uh, was so smart, and you don't have to feel bad. Like smart people trade bad. So, and he was a quite clever guy. Eh? Absolutely, absolutely, man. <laughs> you know, you couldn't get any better than Newton. So good, man. Well, thanks so much. Okay, and, uh, I see you, man. Yep, give us a call anytime, Peter. And uh, if you'd like to give us a call now on World Crypto Network, all one word on Skype, uh, we do have the phone lines open. It's around 925. I'll try to keep this going a little bit longer. I've got to start writing down what time I started. Uh, but I think it's been at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I'm sure the chat knows. Uh, they say uh, they're still talking. Oh, and they were right. It was uh, Robin Ho, uh, Ron Haldinho, Ronaldo, and Robin Ho. Uh, the three R's for Brazil. Incredible players, incredible team. Uh, Brazilian soccer is an amazing thing to watch, even if you're not into soccer. Uh, but boy, did Germany beat them last time. Whew. I, uh, I don't remember the score, but gosh, it was bad. <laughs> Fat Ronaldo was <is> deadly. <laughs> and they're saying uh, TA experts have probably not read the white paper. Uh, that's probably true. It, you don't have to know anything to trade something. Like I could say, hey, buy Amazon. And you don't even have to know that it's a jungle company or whatever. Uh, so uh, funny stuff. People are rooting for uh, Uruguay, Portugal, uh, World Cup coin. That's funny because uh, uh, I think it was Coin Artist was talking on Twitter four years ago or whatever. There was a, a World Cup coin and they had a little system you can gamble on it. And uh, she promoted it. And I, I kind of was critical of her and said, oh, yeah, that's not going to be around in four years. And now it's not around in four years. And she was kind of lamenting that. She said it was fun. And I, I'm sure it was fun to predict all the matches. And there was some kind of other crypto thing that you could do. I don't know that they had their own coin, um, but uh, it was interesting. Let's see. Wow. Uh, I don't know about this. I'm just reading it in the chat. I don't know for sure that this is factual, but it says, uh, Okay, so this guy says, I don't like Ripple, but I don't think their CEO should be kidnapped as Tone suggested. Uh, so I don't know if Tone suggested that, but he really shouldn't suggest that. I have nothing against the CEO of Ripple. I mean, he says horrible things about Bitcoin and he's a billionaire because of Ripple. Um, but I certainly don't want any harm on him. I do think he's a very high level and a high value figure. So he should have some kind of security and he should take uh, careful care of himself. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think we should say that anyone should be kidnapped. Uh, the worst thing about that is that it comes back on you and that people aren't thinking about kidnapping the CEO of Ripple, but thinking about kidnapping Tone. And uh, we don't want that. Uh, that is no good. So let's let's just try not to say negative things about other people. I know it's hard, especially when they're mean to Bitcoin. Oh, now they're telling me about the goals in the game. You're ruining the game. I'll watch it on. That's ah, okay. I, I probably wasn't going to watch it, but I am recording it. I do think it's going to be a good game. I think Germany is a great team. And of course, Mexico is a great team. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do an interview with Andreas. It's been a long time since I've talked to him. I saw him at a Bitcoin convention or something like that not too long ago. Uh, but Andreas is great. And he's done uh, so much in the last few years. It would be interesting to do a catch up and see what it's like to travel the world. Uh, what I hope about Andreas is travels. And I'm not sure because it's it's difficult to travel this way. But uh, the way that I would like to travel is not just to the convention, uh, because often you go like to the town and you go to the convention and you see the inside of the convention hall and then you fly out. Uh, I hope that Andreas has a couple of extra days to spend in the town, to see the museums, to eat the food and to live the life and to meet the people. Uh, that's the way that I would like to travel. Uh, even though it can be difficult with such a schedule of conventions and they're so spread out all over the world. Uh, but I'd be very interesting to talk to Andreas about his travels and what he's seen. Uh, and then, of course, what he thinks about Bitcoin and some of the news. And uh, I think he still has the same vision that he used to have. Uh, it's been a few years and there's been a lot of you know questionable things. And I know he's He's kind of a fan of Ethereum. He wrote the Mastering Ethereum book or, or he's writing it or something like that. But um, still, I, I think he has the same vision for Bitcoin and, and that's what's important. And uh, that's what I like about Andreas. He's a great guy. Oh, they say, did Bitcoin follow the moon cycles? <laughs> and they say, he's still around. He's got charts on TradingView. Uh, so yeah, following the moon cycles might be just as well as trading any other way. Andreas always used to say, that he bought Bitcoin on Monday. 
and he was talking about there is a dollar cost averaging. Andreas would probably put maybe a hundred bucks a week in on Monday. And if the price of Bitcoin's up, that means that he got less Bitcoin. But if the price of Bitcoin's down, that means he got more Bitcoin. So dollar cost averaging is the best way to invest. Uh, and also not to invest more than you can afford to lose. Make sure this is an investment. Make sure it's not your whole life. So this guy says, Thomas sounds like AI. I wonder if that's the tone of my voice or the things that I'm saying. Uh, but I'm fine with that. I do think AI is, well, AI is trying to be like people. <laughs> so if I'm trying to be like AI, I don't know, it's kind of a data Star Trek thing going on there. Uh, but I do think we have to think about things logically. And that's what I try to do. Uh, I like this coin hot crypto. He, he agrees. Thinking is hard. And I think we need to agree with that. Thinking is hard. And if you want to outsource your thinking, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I hope you don't outsource it to me because I'm not looking for that. Other people are. Uh, if you want to follow them, uh, you follow them. But just remember, you're not thinking anymore. They're thinking for you. Uh, you can trust them. Maybe. I don't know. Sometimes. Um, maybe they're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about you. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. Aha, uh -huh, someone's listening to me. They say gas stations who accept Bitcoin. Gas stations who accept Bitcoin. And think about it. They are our great natural allies. The gas stations were the first ones that I learned about that a, a business was being charged for using a credit card because the gas stations passed that charge on to me. They said, oh, if you want to use your credit card, you're going to pay an extra X percent or whatever. That's because they were being charged. And that was one of the big selling points we used to try to sell for Bitcoin. And it will still be true for Lightning Network. I think Lightning Network would be perfect for a gas station. But uh, think about gas. They have prices, cash, dollars, and maybe Bitcoin, right? Because if you're a giant company uh, like Atlantic Ridgefield or, or one of the other ones and you're based in England or you're based in uh, UAE or Saudi Arabia or something like that, you could have that Bitcoin instantly. I could pay you in Wyoming with a lightning or Bitcoin or anything. You could send it back to the mothership and you could have the decisions of how to invest that. You would know that your local gas station is not going to steal that from you. Uh, it's an incredible deal for gas stations to accept Bitcoin. And they're actively against the credit card companies. They're the ones telling us about the fees. Uh, this is a natural ally for Bitcoin. And I still think it will be, but uh, we're probably going to need a major chain to take it. And, and that's another thing you could put on your potential good news list. A uh, major gas station chain starts taking Bitcoin or Litecoin or Lightning Coin. Sorry, Lightning Network, whatever. Uh, but that would be cool. That would be good news. Uh, Matt Smith thinks 2025 before serious adoption. And that is the thing. I mean, I've, I've been in it five years and it feels like 15. Uh, but uh, if we could do this thing 10 years, if we can do this thing 15 years, if we can just keep this thing going and keep new people coming in and keep people interested in Bitcoin and new technology, then the price is eventually going to rise. It doesn't mean it's going to rise every day or all at once, but eventually and maybe even slowly. So they're saying um, even three bottom hits uh, were more likely to break to the downside. It's a descending trend triangle and that we broke the uptrend. And uh, audio, audio video tweaker, thanks so much for the comment. And uh, yeah, sadly, and I don't want to, but uh, I kind of agree that we broke the uptrend. Uh, the big line for me was always that uh, line that connected the bottoms of the bottoms. And I've been watching that one for years and years. And I really felt that that just showed that we were on an uptrend. Uh, but sadly, it feels like uh, we're not an uptrend. So uh, we need to get back in the uptrend <laughs> so we can feel good again. Uh, that's not true. If the king goes down, the others will take over. Well, good luck, guys. I don't know. I, if the Bitcoin price went down 90%, you don't think the altcoin prices would go down 99%? Uh, you really want to feel some pain. Uh, wait for the Bitcoin price to go down. Uh, like lemmings, seriously. Yes, like lemmings, seriously. Lemmings are small creatures that follow each other off the cliff. The first lemming says, hey, let's jump over the cliff. And then all the lemmings follow them. When you outsource your thinking, when you allow someone else to think for you, you are acting like a lemming. And the problem with that cliff is that you're just following the lemming in front of you. All you can see is his ass. You can't even see the cliff. You just keep running. And pretty soon, you're like Wile E. Coyote. You look down, and there's no ground underneath you. 
And if you're not thinking, if you're not paying attention, that can happen to you. So I would be very careful with outsourcing your thinking or trusting a single guru. Uh, get a second opinion. Get more than one brain. Uh, think differently. If you think the same as everyone else, you're going to get wrecked. Uh, remember Warren Buffett's rule. Uh, be, fear be fearful when others are brave and be brave when others are fearful. Uh, that might be a reason to buy. Uh, but if you're going to buy, buy on a percentage. Uh, do 80-20, do 50-50. You've got some options. So, uh, Miners won't sell at a loss. According to Bob, the average cost to produce a Bitcoin is 6 k I've heard 3 k uh, I don't have a figure on that right now. I think Finney Lingham was saying 3 k I've heard 1500 before, but that might have been old. Uh, so once again, it is very important where the cost of producing a Bitcoin is with the miners, how much electricity, how much money it costs. If we fall below that, the miners will be in a position where they either have to sell to cover their electricity and they won't make it, or that they have a reserve built up and they can afford to hold. Uh, either way, that could be a problem. Miners that are currently holding could start selling. Uh, that could change the market. So it is very important where the dollar cost to make a Bitcoin is. Uh, although, again, many of these miners are very well capitalized. They know that holding Bitcoin makes money for them. They know that other miners are going to drop out and they're just going to get more Bitcoin during this time if they have a long enough timeline and if they're willing to take that risk. Uh, the miners are doing the same risk calculations that we're doing. They're 70-30, they're 90-10. They've got a 30% bonus. Uh, they're making the same kind of mathematical choices that we make. And if it goes down enough, they have to make different choices. Uh, how about some bank frauds coming out? Oh, there's been some huge bank frauds. Do you see the $100 million penalty that they put on Citibank for helping to fix the LIBOR rates? Uh, LIBOR is kind of an international interest rate. It's used for setting the price of houses or other large purchases. And Citibank messed with it. And then they only punish Citibank, even though they caused an industry-wide uh, false rate. Industry-wide, the, the rates were wrong. If you bought anything, you got charged improperly because of Citibank. Yet they're only punishing them and only with $100 million. Maybe it was even 60. But even then, it's, a, it's nothing. I mean, for us, it's a lot of money for a normal person. But for Citibank... Uh, it's the cost of doing business and they probably made more off of the manipulation. So banks are definitely still manipulating things, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't change anything to say the Bitcoin market's manipulated, the bank market's manipulated, therefore everything's manipulated. <laughs> That's not an argument. Uh, I know there's a guy out there making that argument with killers. Oh, that country is full of killers and our country is full of killers too. And that's a false equivalence. You're making a false argument. It's a, it's not right. It's a red. It's a, it's a fallacy. Let's see. You can't have infinite monies. People always take the well-known and more valuable currency over alt chains in the in the end. And that is a little bit of the network effect there, right? Uh, the reason that we're stuck with Facebook is because all your friends are on there, and the reason all your friends are on there is because we're stuck with Facebook. And until all your friends go to some other social network which would be very difficult to do, we're stuck with Facebook. In the same way, we're stuck with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the leader. Bitcoin's the first one. Bitcoin has the most hash power. Bitcoin has the most market cap. Uh, Bitcoin has the most programmers. Bitcoin has the most layer two and advanced solutions thanks to, thanks to SegWit. Uh, it's going to take a lot to unseat Bitcoin. And that's why Bitcoin maximalists, or whatever you want to call us, keep telling you that Bitcoin's the best. It's not the other ones. It's, it's like 99% to one, 99% Bitcoin, 1% everything else. And they're trying to say that they're equal. It's not 50, 50. It's not that close. So they're talking about the alts. We're talking about make money and make money work for you as hard as you work for it. That sounds pretty good. Uh, they want to check out audio video tweakers, YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to start a YouTube channel or be a co-host on these shows, you can join the World Crypto Network Slack by sending your email to Mad Bitcoins on Twitter. Uh, you can direct message it for me. Uh, happy, uh, happy Father's Day to the Father's Day uh, fathers out there. Let's see. The chat scrolls every once in a while. Uh-huh. Let's see. 
This crashes thin out the herd. <laughs> well, we still haven't gotten that low yet. We'll see if it goes even th lower. Uh, what about Bitcoin Topia? Okay, so I'm getting some questions about Bitcoin Topia. Uh, I do know Morgan. Uh, Morgan's a character. I kind of think he's kind of a mad scientist. He's part mad, but he's also part scientist and he's really smart. And I like Morgan's projects and his ideas. I think they're really interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if you should invest in them. You can make your own choices and decisions. I think that Elko Nevada is very far away and alone by itself. And building an entire city, including the sewer and the roads and all that is a very big undertaking. Uh, I think it's an exciting and interesting idea, but I'm not sure that it's the one. I don't want to be too critical of it. I'd like to see it work out. I'm rooting for it, um, but I'm not I'm not going to say that you should give up your Bitcoin uh, for most anything. <laughs> so, um, but I like Morgan and I'm rooting for him. Uh, he also has a pretty major issue with a trial coming up. And if you were going to invest in Bitcoin Topia, you'd also have to uh, gauge that against the trial. So uh, uh, much respect to Morgan, though. I like, I like anybody that's working on a Bitcoin project. Uh, I don't know that they're all going to succeed. I don't know that everyone's going to make a lot of money from every Bitcoin project. Uh, but I think we need more Bitcoin projects. We need more people doing things. Uh, I like that Morgan does things. Uh, so he's good. Um, but yeah, make your own decision on investing and so forth. Uh, talking about Ripple, is Ripple a scam? Uh, I need some more water. That's what I need. So let's see. Watch the parliament hearing on Ripple. <laughs> that does sound pretty bad if there's a parliament hearing. Of course, uh, Andreas has been to the Canadian parliament and uh, it went really well. And I think he might have went to the US or somebody, somebody did. They had some uh, US Senate meetings on Bitcoin and so forth once. It's pretty interesting. Oh, guy says Cardano to the moon. <laughs> You're a victim of unbelievably manipulative marketing. <laughs> and that is true. Remember, uh, Bitcoin doesn't have any marketing, right? Bitcoin, the logo is open source and free. I think Satoshi made it himself. Um, I'm out here generally for free. I like donations and uh, sometimes people buy me a computer or a, a trip to a convention, things like that or they just support the show with a Patreon. But in general, I'm not receiving anything from uh, Bitcoin Incorporated. I'm not on a first name basis with Satoshi, uh, though I have met Dorian Satoshi. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Bitcoin has no official marketing. Uh, whereas Ethereum, all these other altcoins, all these ICOs and things have tons of real marketing. They have actual money. They can buy advertisements. They can make advertisements. They could even hire an army of sock puppets if they wanted to say fake things about their cryptocurrency. So when you're investing and also when you're thinking about these other cryptos, you have to keep in mind that what you're watching may be marketing and that it may be really well designed and really well written and perfectly edited and filmed, but it's still marketing. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Excuse me. They say uh, 60000 60, to $120,000 a week are being spent at overstock, yet no one uses it. Uh, so that sounds pretty... Oh, so he's saying it's Ripple, though, maybe. Ripple's being used. Yeah, well, I don't know that, that that's kind of uh, anecdotal evidence there. It's like, yeah, somebody spent some money, but what does that mean? <laughs> so uh, Amazon does Bitcoin indirectly. Yeah, kind of, but not really. If if anything, and I, I don't know how big that website is anymore where you can buy things from Amazon with Bitcoin, kind of. Um, but uh, Amazon doesn't really get any of that. And if anything, that is blocking people from requesting it from Amazon. Uh, if you were really hardcore and you're going to go request it from Amazon, maybe you just go to that website and spend your money instead. Uh, so that might actually be muting the demand and keeping this important information from Amazon that they should take Bitcoin. Uh, although right now, I pretty much have to say that, uh, yeah, I don't see why Amazon would take Bitcoin. Uh, Amazon's got a great system with the credit cards. They can charge you. They can charge you from Amazon Prime or a recurring fee or anything like that. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of problem. 
uh, reversals. Reversals are probably a, a problem for them, but not as much because they're just so big. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know why Amazon would take it, but uh, JW is mentioning that as another possible uh, good news for Bitcoin. Uh, let's see, they're having a fight over whether it's important that you just watch something or you saw it on Twitter or where you're getting your sources from. And it, it's pretty tough. There are a lot of confusing sources if you just see it on Twitter or just see a video about it. Even if you read an article, the article could be paid. Uh, so it comes to a lot of different things. You have to read a lot of articles. You have to think about it. And then you have to follow one of my favorite quotes uh, from the movie Heist. Gene is uh, written by David Mamet, a fantastic playwright. He wrote uh, The Untouchables, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wag the Dog, uh, incredible uh, artist. And uh, what Gene Hackman, who's a criminal, he said, uh, well, how do you do it? And he said, I try to think of what someone smarter than me would do. And then I do that. So that's it. You have to think of what someone smarter than you would do. And you also have to think about what someone dumber than you would do. And you have to think about what the market's going to do and what the smart money is going to do, what the dumb money is going to be doing. And, you know, will that, will the selling pitch that you saw work on smart people? Will it work on technical people? Will it work on dumb people? Uh, maybe the dumb people outweigh the smart and technical people. So it doesn't even matter if it doesn't work technically. Uh, it's going to pump right? Because the dumb money is going to see the advertising and get in. I don't know. There's a lot of variables that you have to weigh. What I think is important is that you think outside the box. You take in all this information and sure, you can take it in from the chart guys. You can take it in from the news guys and the emotion guys and the uh, new stuff and the old stuff. And you have to weigh each piece of information and make up your own mind, make up your own decision. And I hope you'll also put in a little bit of percentages, maybe go 90, 10 or 80, 20. Uh, because that will help you in case you make the wrong decision. If you make the wrong decision and you're going 100 percent or you're going zero percent, uh, you have no recourse, right? If Bitcoin goes up tomorrow, uh, I'm still 30 percent in, so that's still great for me. Uh, if Bitcoin goes up tomorrow and I'm zero percent in, I can panic and I can get back in. Maybe it dips, maybe it goes back up. I don't know. Um, that's still a decent idea. There's been times where I didn't panic. And Bitcoin went up and then it went up more and then it went up more. And you're like, when am I going to get in? When am I going to get in? Uh, the same way when it's going down, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down and you don't get out. Uh, so we just have to adjust our strategies. We have to think with different kinds of information and we have to put that all together. And uh, yeah, you might not be the smartest one out there, but maybe you can think like he would think or she would think. So just something to keep in mind. And, and I, you know, it's, it's okay to have this fight that you guys are having over a ripple or whatever. Um, but just, you know, try to be nice to people and expect that, you know, they've seen different information that you've seen, or they've had different events in their life. Uh, Caso says he remembers the computer game lemmings. I do as well. It's a great computer game, the different types of lemmings, the little stopper guys that can stop them from going off the ledge. Uh, but remember, if you just let the lemmings go all on their own, <laughs> they fall right off the edge. Technically, that's not true for actual animals that are lemmings, um, but it is what we believe about them. So I'm going to repeat it, even though it's uh, technically false. <laughs> but uh, let's check it out. People have been traveling. They're pushing their shows. Uh, it's important to have a show at the same time every day, if you can, uh, to do them on a regular schedule. I think that's really important. It helps people find the show. It helps people come back to the show. And it's one of the things I think that's helping this show uh, get good callers is that the callers are kind of used to now they're like well he'll do a show in the morning and, and maybe a show in the evening and then i can get my call in and i can discuss it with my people and uh, maybe you can get some more information to think about not all the information don't get it all from me don't listen to me 100 percent. that would be ridiculous uh spread it around listen to different people take different percentages uh from different people and, and judge them on that uh, so it looks like they're still going pretty hardcore into the XRP arguments. And uh, you guys can enjoy that on your own. We are nearing the end of this episode of Bitcoin Talk Show. I'm going to do a short reading uh, from my novel. And it's not the best book in the world. It's not Maybe it's not the worst book. Um, you don't have to listen if you don't want to listen. And a quick recap of what we've seen so far. Satoshi Nakamoto is a pink space alien who's crashed his spaceship into John Front's house. 
his friend Mara, who works at Chain River, a popular Bitcoin company, uh, has come over and she's passed out when she saw the pink alien. We were also introduced to Donald Trump, who at this time in real life, uh, November of 2016, was just about to become president. And we've presented a kind of satirical picture of Trump in this book. Uh, don't get upset. It's not meant to be real or 100% accurate. Um, but here it is before all the before all the viewers leave. <laughs> uh, this strategy meeting is boring, Trump thought. I think it's great that the Cubs won, Trump said, completely interrupting his top advisor's conversation, which had been going on at quite a clip, covering important issues of the get out the vote operation for the campaign, which was entering its final week. Truly make or break time for the whole operation. Sir, his political strategist, a man with more than 20 years of experience in the industry said with surprise, usually the boss isn't interested in strategy or policy or anything really. The Cubs, the Cubs, tremendous victory. I'm not from Chicago, but I have a building there. Have you seen it? Tremendous, fantastic. Anyway, the Cubs are Trump. Trump are the Cubs. Are you sure, sir? If anything, the Indians are the team of Trump, the outsiders, the impossible dream. We're not part of the system, not part of the old guard, but loaded with experience. We're the plucky outsiders who are going to clean up this mess. Right, outsiders, but wrong, Indians. Cubs have the best, all the best, must be, must be Trump. Couldn't be anything else. Gold-plated players. You see this Chapman? Throws 100 miles an hour. Very Trump. Put the word out. We're going to the parade. First the Cubs victory parade, then the Trump victory parade. Tell all your friends, going to be tremendous, fantastic, fabulous. And that was all the boss said. He went quiet after that, but you could see he was planning something. There were lights and twinkles in his eyes. He was thinking about the parade, about victory. And that was pretty short, so I'll just read another section. Probably pretty short, too. Did you wake Sleeping Beauty yet? Satoshi said, typing away. Not yet. She seems well out. She's probably tired. Had a long day. Might have stopped off in the few bars on the way here, and of course the shock of seeing your pink dome. Satoshi smiled at the thought of his ugliness having such an effect. You should wake her up. It's not healthy to be unconscious that long for a person. Even I know that. How do you know that, Satoshi? How do you know anything, by the way? I was getting a little mad at him questioning my treatment of Mara. She was going to be fine, just a little shocked. I watch doctor shows. You watch what? Doctor shows. What do you mean? Like TV, man. Why do you think aliens keep coming here? It's not for the scenery, believe me. It's because they have dreams of Hollywood. At this point, my mouth was agape. I almost passed out in shock. But seriously now, John, I want to know, who thought it was a good idea to broadcast all that shit? I mean, most other species aim their transmitters down or limit their range so as not to over-broadcast. But Earth, you're like no other, man. Really, the talk of the galaxy, your shows. Some have even watched the entire programming in order. They do simul screens when you start multicasting. Even the idea might give your human intelligence a headache. But believe me, it's possible. There are experts who study it all. The best part is they still have no idea what you humans will do next. As shocked as they were by the existentialism of Seinfeld and the infinite explorations of The Simpsons, they had no idea that South Park would be coming along to rock the entire galaxy with its satire. And to think, people used to watch The Cosby Show for fun. This intergalactic television review was too much even for me. Aliens watch TV, I repeated. Aliens watch TV? Yes, John, aliens watch TV. Now leave me alone so I can get back to work. At this point, Mara herself interrupted and joined the conversation, groggy and sleepy as she may have been, washcloth over her eyes. John? She sounded weak. I kneeled next to her. Mara, are you okay? John, the Cubs. John, what happened with the Cubs? They won, Mara. They won. At this point, she reached out and kissed me on the lips hard. I even think there was a little tongue. They did it, she bolted upright. They did it. Ha 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 ha. Who the hell is that? Who? The pink guy sitting at your computer ignoring me. That's Satoshi Nakamoto. The last two times we introduced you to him, you passed out. Really? 
Yes, really. I passed out because your friend has a pink mask and a friend who does Hollywood makeup? That doesn't seem likely. Must have been the Cubs or your charming good looks, she said, slapping my face playfully. We'd never kissed before. It was an oddity. Must have been the Cubs. Satoshi, she said, getting up from the couch and putting the washcloth on the coffee table. A pleasure to meet you. She shook his pink hand and he actually turned his, way, his chair away from the computer for a minute. So that's it? You pass out twice and now you believe me that I say I'm Satoshi and an alien? Everything is fine? Satoshi shot me a look that seemed to say, females, can you believe them? I believe it was just Halloween and you haven't gotten your makeup yet off yet. I get it. A lot of people pay a lot of money to their friend, the Hollywood makeup artist, to paint them up like an alien. I like the simple white t-shirt look too. Goes well with the black trench coat. Oh, is that yours too? Satoshi didn't like this. He felt challenged. What about my claim to have invented Bitcoin? I managed to fool John, right? That must mean something. Gavin Andreessen used to be a core developer and he was fooled by Craig Wright. I'm sure you used some trickery to fake the proof on John's computer and he just didn't see it. Hey, no offense meant, she said in a tone that I found patronizing. I'm just saying it was a possibility, darling. Don't get upset. The darling was sarcastic. She was fucking with me. If you're really Satoshi, prove it, she said. And that's about it for this short reading of To Satoshi With Love. Uh, remember, you can always donate in Bitcoin with the QR address on your screen right now. You could even pause it. Let's see if we got any donations today. Um, maybe not today, but it looks like we got another uh, $9 donation, $9.98. Uh, thanks so much for your support. Donor number 0 0.00153401. And thanks so much to our Patreons and uh, everyone in the chat. Had a great time uh, reading that little section and we'll be reading more soon. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to do an audiobook and uh, maybe a couple more times from now, I'll just play you an excerpt from the audiobook. Uh, but thanks so much for watching. We'll probably be back later uh, if I find the time. If not, we'll be back on Monday. I'm not sure if Vortex is doing the Bitcoin news show today. I think he's taking it back to every other week. Uh, so we probably don't have another show for you today on World Crypto Network. But you can always check out the past shows. We did a lot of Bitcoin talk shows this week. Uh, Andy Hoffman did a couple of commentaries and an interview with Francis, Francis Puyot from the Quebec uh, Mining Institute and some other stuff up in Quebec. Uh, so you can check that all out here on the World Crypto Network. Uh, be sure to give us a thumbs up and a share. Uh, subscribe down below. Hit the bell for notifications. And until next time, bye-bye.